As we gather around the Lord's table today, I've chosen a few verses dealing with a common uh, theme that we all face every day, sin. In Romans 5, 12 through 19, it says, Sin came into the world because of one man did, of what one man did, and with Sin came death. This is why everyone must die, because everyone sinned. One man disobeyed God, and many became sinners. In the same way, one man obeyed God, and many will be made right. Then in 2 Corinthians, it says, Christ had no sin, but God made him to become sin so that Christ, we could become right with God. And then in 1 Peter uh, 3.18, Christ himself suffered for our sins once. He was not guilty, but he suffered for those who are guilty to bring you to God. His body was killed, but he was made alive in spirit. It wasn't the Romans who nailed Jesus to the cross. It wasn't the spikes that held Jesus on the cross. What held him to the cross was his conviction that it was necessary for him to become sin, that he who was pure become sin and that the wrath of God be poured down not upon creation but on the creator. When one, the one we knew, no sin, became sin for us, then the sinless is one who's covered with all the sins of the whole world. God did not call his army down of angels to save him. He didn't because he knew he had rather give up his son than give up on us. Regardless of what you've done, it's not too late. Regardless of how far you've fallen, it's not too late. It doesn't matter how low the mistake is it's not too late to dig down, pull out the mistake, and then let it go, and you'll be free. What makes a Christian a Christian is not perfection, it's forgiveness. Because Jesus' death on the cross, we now have the promise of spending eternity with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, this time we can come together and gather around your table of remembrance. As we do so, may we do uh, take these emblems, uh, this cup representing his shed blood that's poured out so freely for us that we may uh, be saved. And this loaf representing his body hung on that cruel cross in our stead. And as we uh, partake of these emblems, uh, let us remember what God provided, Christ did for us. And may we, we do this uh, every day of our lives, remembering what Christ has done for us. We ask for your forgiveness and your blessing. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, unfortunately, this morning I need to uh, negate my dad joke of the week to address yesterday. Um, we all know how I feel about politics from the pulpit, and this is not about politics. No matter where you stand on the political spectrum, God calls you as followers of Jesus to love your enemies and to pray that God would bless them. Violence is never the right option, ever. So I'm going to read something for you 
Psalm 22, verses 27 and 28. Don't worry, Joe, you don't have that back there. I don't want him freaking out trying to find it. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is Yahweh's, and he rules over the nations. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we begin to uh, or continue in our worship of you this morning, God, our, our hearts would be softened to your word. God, that any negative feelings we have towards anyone, God, that you would remove those from us and that we would earnestly pray for those who persecute us. We would pray that you would bless them immensely. God, for a heart that earnestly prays for someone cannot hate them, but only love them. God, I pray that your spirit of peace and wisdom and understanding would flow openly and freely here today, that every ear is made ready to hear, every mind made ready to understand, and every heart made ready to accept your message for each one of us here today. We pray this in the mighty and most precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so welcome to Kent Christian Church, where we believe it is all about Jesus. All the time. We're excited. <laughs> that it really never gets old. I, mean, I don't know if it does for you. If it does, sorry. Uh, not really. I love it. Um, I'm glad that you guys have decided to join us uh, this morning. Those who are watching online, whenever you get around to it, as we continue in our Unstoppable series. All right, this has been an exegetical walk, an exegetical look through the book of Acts, where we've taken an in-depth look and study into the first century church, kind of how they worshipped, how they did life, and most importantly for us, how, how they ministered to those around them. And the best way to understand it and apply it to our lives, as they did, is they focused on Jesus and his ministry. And then they did their very best to replicate that in their lives. So as followers of Jesus, right, that should be our goal, is to live our lives the best that we can as Christ did, to love uh, unconditionally, to show grace, mercy, and truth to everyone we come into contact with, and point everybody to God. That's our hope as Christians, right? And if the church as a whole could come together in that, could you imagine what our world would look like today? It would be a much different place. But as was, was pointed out earlier, we are sinners. We fall short of the glory of God, and we are going to make mistakes. Raise your hand if you make mistakes. Okay, everybody raise their hand. Good deal. Raise your hand if you made a mistake today. Man, you guys are, some of y'all are doing really, really good. I've, I've made several. So y'all are doing, y'all are off on the right foot. So, uh, right, this, our main hope uh, for this entire series and really just coming to church in general is that you would have a real and a more authentic encounter with the living Christ because Jesus isn't dead, right? Jesus is alive today as he was in the very beginning and before the beginning. He exists outside of our time, uh, understanding of time and space and all of this thing that we know as our world. He is greater than all of those things. And so I hope that you would be able to encounter him this morning in a way that maybe you've never encountered him before, or maybe it's been a long time since you've had that authentic encounter with Jesus, where he's got a hold of your heart and he's begun to stir things uh, in hopes of loving him more. So um, I hope that you guys had a chance to read through Acts chapter 24 sometime this past week. Um, you know, it's not really homework, but it is. Now, you're only going to get out of this what you put into it, and unfortunately for you, if you expect me to be able to build your spiritual life in a matter of 30 to 40 minutes one day a week, uh, I feel bad for you because I'm not going to be able to do a whole lot. Nobody ever behind this pulpit will. If you truly want to grow in your understanding of God, your spiritual maturity, you need to do some legwork. Actually, you've got to do almost all of the legwork you got to spend time in the Word of God on your own. Spend time praying that He would reveal things to you when you open the Bible. But as we are going through these week-by-week, week, chapter chapter-by-chapter series, you kind of know what's coming next. We're in Acts 24 this morning. Where are we going to be next week? Acts chapter what? Looky there. You guys can count. I'm so proud of you. So if you're wondering, what should I read this next week? Well, if you come to Sunday school, you should read Romans chapter 13 and... You should read Acts chapter uh, 25, but if you just come to church, read Acts chapter 25 at least once a day or once before you come in next week. 
You'd be surprised what God would reveal to you in his word when you actually spend time in his word. So as we're going through this chapter, this is a phenomenal chapter. In his account of Paul's defense before the governor Felix, Luke gives almost equal space to a couple of things. First, the Jewish charges against Paul in verses 1 through 9. And then we're going to see Paul's reply to those charges in verses 10 through 21. And then Luke wraps it up with Felix's response and consequences in verses 22 through 27. So if you like to break things down into categories, man, does Luke do it for you here. So he does this because he wants to show that despite the devious skill of the Jewish uh, charges and the notorious cruelty and corruptibility of the governor Felix, no other conclusions can be drawn from Paul's appearance before him that Christianity had nothing to do with any kind of political sedition and that the Jewish opposition to Christianity sprang from the Christian claim to legitimate fulfillment of the hope of Judaism in Christ. So Paul makes the argument that this has nothing to do with the Roman government, the empire. I, have, I don't care at all about you and in that. And they're mad because I say I have fulfillment in God because of Jesus and not the law. This is the argument that Paul makes. And really, you can't argue against his argument because he per proves his point perfectly. So let's look at verses 1 through 4 of Acts chapter 24. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. They brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius uh, presented his case before Felix. He said, we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge that this was with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Boy, he is padding him up from the beginning, isn't he? Well, it's, it's incredible how he kind of sets them up on this pedestal. So he presents their case uh, for the prosecution, uh, the governor beginning with this customary speech of praise intended to attract the governor's attention, maybe a little bit of his sympathy. They really care for me. They love me. I am such a good governor, and they know that. So I'm going to listen in maybe a little more intently than I, I may have followed by the statement of the charges in verses 5 through 9. Let's look at that. It says, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. So these three charges laid against Paul are probably only a piece of the entire case. Right? These are just the three main attributes of it. But this piece, this part of it, makes it clear that Tertullus and all the rest of the Jewish leaders intended to create the impression of political sedition against Rome in the first two charges disturbing the peace among the Jews and being a ringleader of this Nazarene sect. And then to argue the right for Judaism to impose a death penalty and the third charge, the attempting to uh, desecrate the temple. Now, during his reign over Judea, Felix uh, had repeatedly crucified the leaders of various uprising in order to squash it, to put it down, to silence them. He killed many of the followers uh, for disturbing what's called the Pax Romana, which is about a 200-year period of peace in the Roman Empire. So Tertullus, his endeavor here, as supported by the high priest and the Jewish elders along with him, was to put Paul on the same level as thieves with the hope that his um, insensitivity to the issues would enrage Felix and would get him onto their side and respond in his normal manner, which was death. As in Jesus' trial before Pilate, their accusations were framed principally and primarily around political sedition, though all along their main grievance was religious, because 
uh, when it came to the religion, the Romans didn't really care. But when it came to governing, the Romans cared a lot. And if you were to create riots or unsettling groups that would, that would push against the Roman government, uh, whoever was in charge of that area was then punished for not being able to control their people. So they looked down on this quite a bit, and the, the consequences were severe. So for you to be a leader of this uh, crazy religious sect of people that was pushing against the Roman government, well, obviously the governor's response is going to be crucifixion. I'm going to kill the one at the head of this because if I kill him, the rest of them will, will, will just scatter to the wind. Look at verse 10. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over the, this nation, so I gladly make my defense. So Paul has been invited to respond to these charges now. And Paul begins with a complimentary statement. You've done a good job, and I'm glad to make my defense before you. Felix had been in contact with the Jewish nation in Palestine for over a decade, first in Samaria, and then as a governor over the entire province of Judea. So therefore, Paul was pleased to make his defense before someone who was in a position to know the situation and understand his words in the proper context. Felix wasn't removed from the issues. He understood them because he's been around the Jewish leadership for over a decade. So he kind of understands the way they think. Look at verses 11 through 13. Paul says, You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. So in refuting the charges against him, Paul dealt with each charge in order. First, it was no more than 12 days ago that he came to Jerusalem, not for political uh, agitation, but for worship. In such a short time, he, he implies that there's no way that there would be a sufficient amount of time for me to stir up a revolt against the Roman government. I haven't been here long enough to do what they say I'm doing. Second, his accusers could hardly charge him with being a ringleader of any sedition, for he was alone when they arrested him in the temple. They could not cite a time when he was stirring up a crowd anywhere in the city, let alone in the temple. And then thirdly, their claim that he desecrated the temple was unproved because it was entirely without foundation. Look at verses 14, 15, and 16. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. So Paul emphasizes the common ground he has with the Jewish audience, even those who are, are accusing him, including his worship, his belief in the Jewish law, acceptance of the prophets and what they had to say, and a hope in the resurrection. Right? God will raise the righteous and the unrighteous at the last judgment. Paul constantly kept this final appointment before God and with God at the forefront of his mind. Now, a little bit later, we're going to see that the fear of the coming day of judgment will unnerve the governor a little bit in verse 25, but we'll get there in a little bit. Look at verses 18 through 21. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So continuing the summary of what took place in Jerusalem, Paul spoke of his arrest in the temple in verse 18 and his arraignment before the Sanhedrin in verse 20, which we looked at last week. But he insisted there was no crowd to incite nor any attempt on his part to create any kind of disturbance anywhere. 
Instead, he was taken by the crowd while worshiping in a ceremonial clean condition. Paul was saying, I did all the things the right way by the law, and they came in and broke the law. Their charges against me have no foundation at all. If the Jews from the province of Asia who instigated the riot had any serious charge against him, they should have been present before the governor to accuse him. See, Roman law imposed heavy penalties against accusers who abandoned their charges, and the disappearance of accusers often meant the withdrawal of a charge. So Paul is pointing out the fact that according to Roman law, those who bring a charge against him, if they are not there, those charges are thrown out. Or, even worse, they're lying. And to bring false charges carried heavy consequences. Now, their absence suggested that they had nothing against him that would actually stand up in a Roman court of law. Nor did the Sanhedrin. Paul went on, find any crime in me, except that I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, Paul declared he was on trial because he believed in the resurrection of Jesus. So all this other nonsense that they're trying to lay on him was just a smokescreen to battle this religious belief that was really taking root and spreading throughout the known world. Look at verses 22 and 23. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, so he understood the Christians, what they believed, where they come from, and who they were worshiping, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So Felix summed up the situation accurately. After a decade in Palestine, he was in his own way well acquainted with the Christians and what they believed. And while indeed not a Christian himself, he could see the Jewish charges against Paul were entirely religiously based, even though they were being disguised as political sedition. He was no dummy. He caught on to their roots. He wanted to keep the peace, however, within his jurisdiction, because remember, if he pushed them too far and they revolted against him, it was his fault and he would get punished for this revolt. So he wanted to keep the peace, so he puts Paul in, in jail. So Paul was placed under this protective custody in the palace of Herod the Great. Ananias was given the deceptive promise that a decision would be reached when the commander Lysias came down to uh, Caesarea and presented his testimony. As a Roman citizen, Paul was allowed some freedom and permitted uh, visits from friends and uh, you know close uh, contacts for his needs. If he had something, he could call a friend. Well, couldn't call nobody, right? Or write a letter or whatever. They could just bring and supply his needs for him. Look at verses 24 and 25. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. This is important. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. So Drusilla a little bit about her, was the sister of Herod Agrippa II and Bernice. Uh, Drusilla had abandoned her former husband, Isaias, the king of Emesa, and married Felix. Drusilla was Jewish, so in forsaking her original husband and marrying Felix, she disregarded God's commands on marriage found in Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Malachi. So what Paul has just said not only stirs Felix, but I'm assuming his wife, who knows the law, who understood the consequences of breaking God's law and sinning would have felt uneasy as well. And in their conversation with Paul, Drusilla and uh, Felix were confronted with the prospect of final judgment, which we all know is final, <laughs> right? When, when God judges in the end, that is it. There is no second chance. There is no, what about this? What about that? That is it. And Paul's words about righteousness, self-control, and then that coming divine judgment frightens them because they were notably corrupt. Just as when we talk about righteousness and self-control in the church, we should all be convicted because 
we're not fully righteous. Right? We, we lack in the areas of self-control more often than not. Why? Because we are sinners and we are not perfect and we fall short of the glory of God. Any time you enter into a, a moment of interaction with the word of God, you should be convicted. If you are not, there's one of two things that have happened. One, you are not actually reading it. Or two, whoever is speaking is not doing their job. Not that we would feel lowly or ashamed or bad of our shortcomings, but so that we could be rescued back to God. Repent of those sins and come closer to him. Look at verses 26 and 27. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. This is Felix. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant uh, a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So Felix kept Paul in custody, hoping for a bribe, which was kind of customary for the time. But Paul didn't give a bribe. And when this failed and his term as governor ended, and because Paul never really tried to grease the wheels at all, he left him in prison to gain the favor of the Jewish people. Felix was replaced as governor in about 60 A.D. by the Procius Felix, or Festus. Sorry. So what is there from Acts 24 that we can use as an application to our lives today? Because that's important, right? We don't want to just read the Word of God and understand the Word of God. We want to apply the Word of God to our lives so that it can then affect change in our lives so that we could better reflect God to the world around us. So what is it in this chapter that we can apply to our lives? So there's no way to escape criticism from people who don't love Jesus. Now, you all know that, right? Everybody shake your heads up and down, yes. We understand that you are going to... Uh, you are going to be looked down upon for your faith in Christ. You're going to be called all kinds of names. The criticism is going to be there no matter what. You will never be able to profess Jesus correctly while avoiding all backlash. I'm going to say that again. You will never be able to profess Jesus correctly while avoiding all black backlash. What that means is if you avoid those difficult situations because you don't want to deal with it, are you accurately sharing the word of God with everyone? Everybody shake your heads left and right. No. You're avoiding it. Why? Because it makes me uncomfortable. Find it in the Bible for me where it says it's okay to not share the gospel if you're uncomfortable. I'll wait. You won't. You'll find the exact opposite. Right? Even if your life is squeaky clean and your words are spoken with precision and tactfulness, there will be those who will come after you. Jesus promised it would be this way. In John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So it may seem kind of weird to think of it this way, but I want you to kind of lean in a little bit for a moment. If you are being persecuted against because of your faith, if you are living your life out loud for Jesus in this world, you are going to face persecution. When that happens, don't feel beaten down. Don't feel downtrodden. Be joyful in suffering first and foremost. Give God all of the glory and then realize you're doing the right thing. If you weren't different from the world, the world would not care. If you're being persecuted because of your faith, it's because you're living your faith out in front of those who do not know Jesus. Remember to do so in such a way that you hope to rescue them back to God. But when you're living for God out in the world, the world will absolutely push back. People hated Jesus. He was perfect in life and speech. He never did anything wrong. They still hated him. If you even live an upright life, people will lie about you to discredit you. They will begin to spread rumors about you and all the evil, nasty little things you do because, well, if I can't find anything concrete, then I'm going to begin to spread the seeds of doubt. 
We need to make sure that we do not prioritize avoiding criticism over getting the gospel message into the world. When your final day comes, you will not wish that you had made more money, acquired more stuff, lived more comfortably, taken more vacations, watched more television, pursued a more lavish retirement, or been more successful in the eyes of this world. Instead, you will wish that you had given more of yourself to living for the day when every nation, tribe, people, and tongue will bow around the throne and sing the praises of the Savior who delights in the radical obedience of those who belong to him. You will wish you had more time to have that conversation with that person. Let me encourage you, have that conversation today. Don't make the excuse of, oh, when the time is right, because the time will never be right. The time is right now. You are not promised another moment. Don't wait for another day which you could get done today. It's easy to use the phrase, God's will for my life, as an excuse for inaction or even disobedience. Instead of searching for God's will for my life, I hope we will learn to seek hard after the Spirit's leading in our lives today, right now, where God has called you to. I hope that we learn to pray for an open and willing heart and surrender to the Spirit's leading, whatever it may be. And that is scary. I know. I love what Francis Chan says about being this radical, obedient follower. He said, the key to everything is surrender. Meaning nothing else will happen until you fully surrender. To come before the Lord and say, I will stay here as long as you want me to stay. Which is comfortable for us, isn't it? Or, God, I will go anywhere on the earth. Which is not comfortable. It's change. It's scary. The call of Christ is to deny ourselves, to let ourselves go, to relinquish all control of our life, to surrender everything we are and everything that we do to him. Our direction, our safety, and our security are no longer found in the things of this world. They are found in Christ and in Christ alone. When you can find that radical obedience in your life, you will find life like you have never seen it before. There is freedom found in the obedience to the call. The question is, will you be obedient? Will you fall, follow the call that God has given every single one of you because God has called every single one of you to a specific job? in his kingdom, whatever that may be. It's your choice to follow. There's only one answer. It's either yes or no. You make the choice. In a moment, we're going to close with a song of worship, and as we do so, I pray that God would uh, make known his call for each and every one of you. And whatever it, that call may be, I, I would pray that you would be uh, courageous enough to be obedient to that call. If God is calling you to stay, then stay. If God is calling you to go, then go. Because there's, there's blessings on the other side of the unknown. Obedience is always rewarded in the kingdom of God. You may not see those rewards here in this life, but I promise you they are there in the next. If you would please join me in a, a word of prayer as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we begin to move forward from this very moment, now that you would reveal that call that you have given each one of us. And God, I would I pray for the courage to be obedient to that call, even in the unknown and the scary. Because you absolutely qualify the call. God, if you are calling us to it, you will help us through it. And I pray the courage to walk faithfully. We don't have to see the entire staircase. We just have to have faith to take the first step. And God, I pray that for every person here this morning and those who are watching online. God, I pray for the, uh, again for uh, our nation, God, that you would bring us together as one people under you first and foremost, and that our hearts would, would break for what breaks yours. God, that we would love uh, unconditionally. We would show unwarranted grace and mercy, and we would share the desperate truth of the gospel 
with all of those around us who are suffering and lost. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.